All right, well, our guest speaker tonight is Suzanne C. Staggs. She's a professor here at the Henry DeWolf Smith or Smith, Smith Professor of Physics. Um, her uh, talk is entitled Looking Backwards with the Cosmic Microwave Background. Um, the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, emanates from a brilliant plasma that suffused the universe in its first moment. Since the first deliberate measurement of radiation comprising the CMB in the mid 60s, our capacity to detect and decode its cosmological signatures has increased remarkably. Professor Staggs will describe the way the CMB encodes information about not only the large scale dynamics and structure of the universe, <clears throat> but also about its earliest instance and its likely future. Okay, not trivial stuff, I think you agree. Uh, to study the largest length scales in the universe, researchers use thousands and thousands of tiny thermometers which measure the fluctuations in the heat delivered by the CMB and special purpose telescopes located in some of the most extreme environments on and above the surface of the Earth. After describing some of this instrumentation, Professor Stagg will conclude by discussing future prospects for even more knowledge she and her research team intend to pry from the CMB. Um, Suzanne Stagg received her undergraduate degree in physics from Rice University and her PhD in physics from Princeton University. Her thesis advisor was David Wilkinson, one of the leaders of the eponymous uh, Wilkinson Microwave and Isotopy Probe. WMAP satellite. After two years as a Hubble Fellow at the University of Chicago, she joined the faculty in Princeton, where she is currently the Henry DeWolf Smith Professor of Physics. She is the current Principal Investigator of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, Co-Director of the Simmons Observatory, an American Physical Society Fellow, a member of the National Academy of Science, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research focus is the experimental study of the cosmic microwave background radiation, including precise measurements of its electromagnetic spectrum and thus its black body temperature and exploration of its polarization properties and fine scale angular and isotropes. Her present CMB work focuses on searching for the signature in the CMB polarization of gravity waves from an inflationary epoch in the primordial universe and in using the CMB as a backlight to probe the growth of gravitationally bound structures in the last 13 billion years. This growth depends on such fundamental quantities as the nature of dark energy and the mass of the neutrino. Uh, my pleasure to introduce you. Professor Staggs. Thank you for the um, long and wholesome <laughs> introduction. Yeah, you shouldn't need that. Oh, I can just talk about You can just talk about it. All right, I stood it. All right, let me share my screen. And you were given the lapel mic? I'm told three times to get this. <laughs> I can go up on your shoulder or something somewhere up there. Um, thank you again for um, inviting me. Uh, I, I'm in the physics department, so I hardly ever come over here. Although, actually, I'm associated faculty here, I guess, because my topic um, is uh, touches on the astronomical world being what I would just call astrophysics or cosmology. So um, I want to talk today about the CMB um, and just as a very short intro, I'll read what's on the screen, which is that the CMB is it's radiation that's left over from this really early epoch in the universe when the universe had cooled down enough so that neutral hydrogen could form out of the original hot plasma. 
and the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old when the CMB was released. And so there's uh, been just a huge amount of information that we've garnered from it because it's this harmony, <laughs> this extremely early epic of the universe. Um, so uh, the New York Times uh, recently brought the CMB back to our attention in describing um, the current status of the historic Homedale antenna that discovered the CMB with um, Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias. And um, uh, they said right here, where the universe began. And it's right under that photo of Homedale. So I'm like, yes, what I get out of this article is that the universe began in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> all right. So back in the middle of the last century, um, people were asking themselves questions like, where did we all come from? Or where did carbon-based life forms come from? Or heck, where did carbon come from? Or where did helium and hydrogen come from? And it was that last question of where did helium and hydrogen come from that Ralph Alper and, and, and colleagues were very focused on answering. And in thinking hard about where helium and hydrogen might have come from, uh, he actually, Ralph Alfer, actually uh, realized that there could have been radiation left over um, uh, from these big bang nucleosynthesis processes. But he didn't kind of underline it and jump up and down. So uh, come 1965, there was uh, 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 people at Princeton um, who decided to see if they could actually measure it. And, they, and uh, folks at Princeton had, uh, these are um, Jim Peebles, Bob Dickey, Peter Roll, and David Wilkinson, of whom uh, only Jim Peebles and Peter Roll are still with us, but Jim Peebles, you know, he just won the Nobel Prize. Um, so he's, he's been doing very well. Um, so uh, they, they had recalculated um, the, uh, uh, signal intensity that there might be in that leftover radiation back at that time. And so then in 1965, uh, bang, it all, it all happened. Uh, it, 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 the CMB was discovered by Penzias and Wilson, and that itself is a whole great and fabulous story. Um, and, and at the same time, Peebles, Dickey, Roland Wilkinson published a back-to-back -back paper with the announcement of the detection of it. They published sort of an interpretation um, paper of it in a really nice New Jersey, New Jersey type of uh, confluence there. So right, at the, uh, right in that very first paper, um, it was uh, Penzias and Wilson described this leftover radiation as being uh, nearly isotropic, meaning every single direction that they were able to look toward from Homedale, New Jersey, they saw approximately the same size signal. And they were also even able to measure that it was not particularly polarized, uh, the light in the CMB. Um, and the polarization of the CMB is of great interest uh, these days because it's patterns in the polarization that could carry this um, imprint from gravitational waves from the very, very, very first instance, like atto, atto seconds of the, of the universe. Um, okay, so that was 1965. It was kind of a banner year. I was born that year. Um, um, and then move forward to 1989. And at that time, um, between 1965 and 1989, there was just this progression of of people trying to go out and make more measurements of the CMB. It was not actually that many people. There was a sort of small cohort of people that were interested. In, they, they included Dave Wilkinson and, and maybe three or four other faculty members at other institutions. And people at that time were really interested in measuring either the temperature of the microwave background or more like its intensity at different wavelengths. So trying to get the spectral um, signature that you know we just saw from the supernovae, uh, but these are all in in I've, I've plotted it as uh, millimeters there, but it's the microwave background, so it's in the microwave wavelengths. And um, and then this satellite named Hobie came out with this amazing 
a full picture of the, I don't know if they're like, um, what, I'll just gesture. Uh, they came out with this amazing um, uh, spectrum. So that blue line is actually beta. The error bars are too small. The error bars are too small to um, see on this plot. And it is one of the best measurements ever made of this relationship between the intensity and wavelength um, of something called a black body. So uh, it's, it's also known as Planck's law. And um, it, it says that you get a, a shape that is specifically defined by what the temperature of the black body is. And so from the spectrum, Kobe was able to realize, was able to define the temperature of the black body as 2.725 Kelvin. And henceforth, we almost always talk about the temperature of the microwave background instead of its intensity. And we carry that over to the thing that we're all super excited about doing now, which is looking for its anisotropy. I said it was mostly isotropic, but actually it varies slightly as you go from position to position in the sky. And um, that uh, anisotropy we usually describe in temperature units. This is why. Um, okay, so uh, as I'm going to elaborate in a couple of slides, the the fact that this leftover radiation actually existed implied that the universe was not in a steady state. Prior to that, that was the um, assumption that things were similar to how they'd always been. And um, it was known since 1929 that um, the universe was expanding, but uh, the thought was that perhaps it had just been expanding and would keep forever and would keep on expanding forever. And so 1965 was really a radical um, adjustment of people's thinking about the universe. And here's one um, way the New York Times retrospectively looked back to describe what happened. The universe, there was the Big Bang, and then there was the big anti-climax. Um, so I think that was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> okay. So, but I will tell you a little bit more about what we think was actually happening from, from the Big Bang until recently. And um, to do it, I'm, this is like my, my guidebook to getting your head around why people are, are fascinated by the CMB, uh, why they were originally and why there's still continued interest in it. So it starts with these facts about the universe, which is we look around today and it is cold. And what I mean is we look around and we find this leftover radiation and it looks just like a black body that's at only three degrees above absolute zero. So 270 Celsius below freezing. Um, it's lumpy, meaning there are galaxies and other interesting objects um, everywhere you look. And we know that it's expanding. And so if you kind of just run the movie backwards, you would say that in the past, it must have been denser because the universe is expanding now. Um, and when things um, are uh, uh, more crushed together into a smaller space, that turns out to mean it gets hotter. Um, and also it was probably less lumpy because we think those galaxies have formed due to the attraction of gravity. And so if, you, uh, if they continue to be attracted by gravity, that would mean that the contrast and mass would be getting larger and larger. Okay, so you can conclude from that type of reasoning um, that at some point in the past, the universe was so hot and so dense that at atoms couldn't have existed because uh, atoms would have been colliding into each other constantly and, and creating photons. And then the photons would be energetic enough that if an electron and a proton temporarily bound together by their electromagnetic um, attraction to one another, a photon could immediately blow apart that bond. As long as the photon had 13.6 eV, as I remember from high school, because that's what it takes to, um, to break apart hydrogen or more. Um, and so uh, at some earlier point, the universe must have been filled with a plasma. That's, that's what it is. We don't have Okay, and then you know, wind the film film forward again. The universe was expanding, and and expanding is the direction where it cools off. So eventually, it cooled off so much that in fact atoms could form. 
And what I mean by that is it cooled off so much that that Planck spectrum uh, didn't have very many high energy photons. And uh, so at that point, it was uh, very unlikely that there'd be a photon with 13.6 eV. And so um, the photons, the atoms actually formed, and then they were sort of unmolested by being broken apart by high energy photons because there weren't high energy photons. And um, at, at that time, once the, once the electrons and protons were um, together in, in hydrogen, the universe was neutral. And the photons, they interact um, primarily electromagnetically. So once there wasn't any charged stuff in the universe, the photons just decoupled. And we think that that um, happened rather, rather in terms of, um, of hundreds and thousands of years. That epoch was quite short, only like 10,000 years. And so it was almost as if uh, the universe was going along, there was a plasma, radiation couldn't travel very far, um, and then suddenly the universe cooled off, and after that, photons just left for wherever they were, they started free streaming, which meant they started just traveling at the speed of light, and they were very unlikely to be deflected because there was no charged stuff to deflect them. Um, yeah, okay. <coughs> So, and the CMB we think is that leftover thermal radiation that was in the plasma that's been free streaming like that. Um, and so, because this was this rather quick period of time, any anisotropy in the CMB that we measure today, it's giving you information. It's like tracing the conditions that were present at that decoupling period, which was only about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe is almost 14 billion years old. So, so it's giving you this primordial information. That's what makes it so exciting. Um, another way of saying is that when you look at the CMB, this is the title for my talk, that you're, when, you, when you make images of the CMB, you're actually looking backwards through the universe to that early, early epoch. Um, and I have been, if you've ever seen me give a public talk before, I might have shown this because this is just this amazing um, book of poetry and it's called The Surface of Last Scattering. And that term is the term that we um, often used to describe the CMB images that we get. And, um, but I also like it because of this, uh, this wording. So, the, the poet writes, how shape a full-bodied intelligence speaking for an open-hearted listening? And that somehow just speaks to me about what it's like when you um, are aware that you're talking to a, you know, a, a highly intelligent audience, but you're a little worried that you're not going to say the right words that convey your meaning. And I feel it especially when I'm giving a, a talk in front of people, but you know, I also feel it sometimes when I'm just talking to my friends. Um, so, so just one more point on this fact that the CMB was, you know, decoupled when the universe was only 400,000 years old. And then, but the deal is that the speed of light is finite, it's not zero, and the universe is, let's say, 14 billion years old. And so the CMB photons had just been traveling at the speed of light, hardly ever being knocked off course for about 14 billion years. So what that means, remember finite speed, uh, finite time, it means that a CMB photon that's arriving right now, it came from the, and it's arriving uh, here right now, it came from a specific distance away that I can know from knowing how long it was traveling and the speed it was traveling. It's very tempting to say it was 14 billion light years ago, but you know, the universe is, uh, been expanding and so forth. So it's not exactly 14 billion light years, but roughly. So a photon that arrives that hits me from that direction, a photon that hits me from that direction, they must have come from the same distance away. And I could keep making that argument and I'd be describing a spherical shell. So the surface of glass scattering is this spherical shell. Mm -hmm. So anyway, surface, that defines a surface, the, a sphere around um, us. <laughs> Okay, so 
you know, when you have a spherical surface and you want to depict it on a on PowerPoint, you need to to make a two dimensional representation of the universe. And I just wanted to quickly talk to you about something that probably a bunch of you are experts on, but there are lots of different ways to do that. Go from the sphere to the two-dimensional representation, open along the way. How do you think of people who equate the word nigger with the word tranny, or say that the word tranny is an offensive slur just like nigger? Okay. Well. So this is a. I just muted all. Hang on a second. I don't know where that came from. All right, go ahead and speak. Ira, can you? Okay. Yeah, so, she's, she's fine. I did, didn't know where that came from either, but it seems to be okay. Let's continue. Okay, two dimensional representation. So, map projections and the celestial sphere. So, this is just a depiction, you know, one way that you could depict the globe. But this um, depiction on the right, which, um, you know, it's not, it's, it, this is an optical image, and this is an infrared image, oh, sorry, infrared image. Uh, but th this way of stretching out the globe um, is called a mole wide projection. And it's cool because you can see the backside. You know, here you're only seeing a uh, part of the earth. And once you put it in this oval form, you can see the entire um, uh, image of the globe. So here's a two-dimensional representation of the universe in visible light. Um, as you see, this was made in just about 2000, but it's, uh, you know, it's it's definitely one for the books. I'm sure it's been the A-pod before and so on because it's so beautiful. Um, but here is our, here's the, the um, a representation of the universe in microwaves, and I call it a low resolution I have, I have a question. Okay. Go ahead. How do you think of people who equate the word nigger with the word tranny, or say that the word tranny is an offensive slur just like nigger? Just mute everybody. Turns out that it, it, it came from the very first satellite that observed the CMB, uh, the COBE satellite, and uh, uh, it was immediately recognized for what it is, which is um, a, an example of Doppler motion. So the fact that the light um, in one direction looks red, so it looks like it's a different frequency or wavelength, and the light in the other direction looks uh, dark blue or purple. That's a classic uh, thing that happens when you have the Doppler effect um, with light. So you're probably familiar with this Doppler effect, which is the Doppler effect with sound, but you get a very, very similar type effect if you are, um, say, in a spaceship and you're traveling very quickly, you need to be traveling near the speed of light, but you're traveling in one direction, you'll see blue shit. Oh, you all know this because you all know all, all about red shit. Well, anyway, uh, so, so in this case, the interpretation is uh, that we, or the satellite, must have been moving with respect to the fixed frame of the CMB. And you can um, pick out a, a specific direction here and, and, and figure out what the actual speed is with which we're moving. And then you can interpret it in terms of our motion around the sun, our, our, um, uh, the sun's motion within the galaxy, and so forth. And uh, in terms of magnitude, it's about plus or minus three thousandths of a Kelvin, where a Kelvin is the same size as a degree Celsius. Oh, you can keep looking. Then once you remove that, and then you do a little more uh, tweaking with the image to get rid of some pesky stuff associated with our galaxy, you end up with this two-dimensional representation. But I was going to take this quick side trip 
um, to talk about the thousands of little thermometers that Victor mentioned earlier, um, because in uh, my lab, we have a one of our specialties is to work on making the detector systems that work for the cameras that we put on these telescopes that are in um, the high desert in Chile. Um, so this is what an instrument interlude. Um, so the way that we do these things is we use devices that are called TES bolometers, and I'm gonna uh, spell out what that all means. So um, what's shown here is a is a cartoon of a bolometer, and this square in the middle is a chunk of material that's able to absorb photons. And uh, so that's indicated here. The the in our case, it's going to be the microwaves that come to us from the microwave background. Those photons they get absorbed in this square, and when they do so. <laughs> In, they have some initial energy and then they get stopped by being absorbed. And so they deposit energy into this, um, they deposit their heat into this square. And um, the photons keep coming and coming and coming. So the, this is described as a power. It's not just like one little blot of heat, a continuous flow of heat. Um, and then the way that a bolometer works is, is that heat heats up the little square. And so you put a thermometer on there to measure how much the um, photons are causing it to heat up, but you couldn't do that forever. It would get really hot and things would melt and so forth. So you also attach it to a cold reservoir, which we often call the bath. Um, and in our case, the cold re reservoir is at about 80 millikelvin. And we use dilution refrigerators to get things that cold, just 80,000 of a degree above zero. And so uh, uh, in this way, um, what you're able to measure is fluctuations in the heat coming in from the photons. So we're able to point at one point, one uh, patch on the sky and uh, uh, measure the amount of power that we're getting there. And then we move, we're constantly moving the telescope and we're able to see the variations that we have when we do that. Um, but I want to say a couple more things about it. In particular, I want to talk about the TES part of the bolometer. Mm -hmm. um, so we use a, a so it, TES stands for transition edge sensor. And so what we do is we use a superconductor that's held really near its superconducting transition. And the nature of the superconductor is that it has um, some sort of resistance. It's a resistor. Uh, that we call the normal resistance. And then at some point, you, as you cool it down, its resistance starts plummeting and eventually becomes zero, um, truly zero, uh, when you're below that transition temperature. But in between, you get this really steep response curve. So the resistance changes hugely as the temperature changes. So it makes it a really, really great thermometer in this heat any tiny temperature range. So you might think that's crazy. Why would you try to use a thermometer that only works in that tiny range? How are you going to get it to be that your bolometer is always sitting at that temperature? And this is just an aside for those of you in the audience who are geeks, which you know from the <laughs> announcement seems like it might be a fair. Um, so it's like this. The way you do it is you take this resistor and you attach it to a fixed voltage. And then you'll be able to measure when the resistance changes, you'll be able to measure it by somehow measuring the current in that loop. And we do cool stuff to measure the current. Um, but so then the current will be a function of time that, that is inversely proportional to the resistance as a function of time. So there you go. But once when you hold it with this fixed voltage like that, we call that you give it a voltage bias, that's the, the term. Um, when you hold um, this resistor in, on a bolometer in voltage bias, you get this electrothermal feedback. So the way that that works is you may remember back to, um, you know, an early physics class you had where you found that there was heating in a resistor. A resistor gets hot when you run current through it, and it goes like I squared times R. Um, or maybe you remember it goes like I times V. 
Or you might remember that you could also represent it when the V is fixed, you could represent it as V squared over R. And for reasons that I don't know how to trace, we call that the joule power. So this heating that occurs when current is flowing through your thermometer is called the joule heating. And here's the cool thing, it goes like one over R. So the total power that's causing the barometer to warm up there's the heat from the photons, but in addition, this power is also causing it to heat up. But when um, the uh, when the heat from the photons goes up, uh, that will cause the temperature of the thermometer to go up, and that means the resistance will go up. And the resistance going up means that this joule power will go down. So you can you can balance out the heat from the photons with the heat in the joule power. And in so doing, you can keep this thing in perfect thermal equilibrium. The heat flowing in will then be able to just continuously flow out this side, but you'll be able to record everything that's happening by looking at these currents. And in the end, you keep it just completely stably at the temperature that you desired. And it's, it's, uh, it's still sort of amazing. It's one of my favorite things about our and then this is just meant to be kind of a glamour beauty shot. A few years ago, I was giving a very technical talk at, to a bunch of people who also make um, these transition edge sensor bolometers, mostly for the CMB. And I was just showing that though people do different physical layouts to make their bolometers, um, they all work on roughly the same principle. And this is the type of, Bolometer made at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder that we've been using for in my lab for quite quite a long long time. And what you see in this picture is this rectangle is the square that I mentioned before, and the thing in the middle is this fancy um, superconductor transition edge sensor. Okay. So that was the interlude on the instrument. And um, now I'm going to go back and <laughs> talk to you about how we extract information from this type of two-dimensional uh, measurement of the sky in, in, from, from the CMB. Um, and it's that we somehow look at this picture and we find patterns. And um, uh, uh, that's what I want to describe for, <clears throat> So it, the, for me to describe it, it's gonna um, involve putting probably slightly more equations on the slides than are usually recommended um, in a talk, especially after that time. But I'm gonna go through quite quickly and in a minute, I'm gonna get to images. So just, you know, so much right. So, because what I wanna do for is talk to you about Fourier transforms, for those of you um, who have not met before. So um, a Fourier transform is this mathematical thing that lets you take an, an, an ordinary object uh, and represent it as a, a sum of sinusoids. So suppose you had a string and you knew its height as a function of um, the horizontal distance along the string. So that'd be a function y of x and you could represent it with this sum that had all of these sine waves that wiggled in, in different amounts. So that's an equation, but here's a picture. So here's a, a possible wiggly string um, and a snapshot of it, where it might look like this. And the process of doing the Fourier transform um, means that you need to recognize that this black wiggly line is actually comprised of the red and green only have two of them. It's actually the sum of these red and green lines. So if you look carefully, that red line is just one sine wave, and then there's a faster green one, and then I think there's, sorry, that one was orange, and then there's one red one. Um, and so I did it for these discrete, somewhat easy to see sine wave, but it's true in general that any one-dimensional function uh, you can break up into this um, type of sum, sum of sine waves. And um, just, okay. And then once you've done that, 
once you found all of those coefficients, let's go look at the equation again. Isn't it nice? So what you what you can do is you can take the real life y of x, and then you can you can do a mathematical process where you can figure out what all these amplitudes are for the different um, wavelengths of, of wriggly green and red components. And then you can go backwards and you can replace the actual Wrigley screen. Ooh, you can replace the actual Wrigley screen string with this simpler representation that just says, oh, it had three characteristic leg scales in it. The one that was associated with that orange kind of slow wiggle, the one that was associated with the intermediate red wiggle, and the one, this one, and the one that was associated with the fast green wiggle. Okay, so you can do that, and you may ask why would you want to, but, but you're going to understand why, or maybe you already understand why, when you see what happens when you do to that, this process to the CMB image. Something super cool happens. Um, when I showed you the awesome equation, I also included that plus theta term, which is known as the phase, and um, I'm ignoring the phase in this case. Um, the phase has to do with whether each one of these riddles starts, um, you know, at zero or not. And um, anyway, so uh, uh, you can do the exact same type of process with two-dimensional images. Yay! There is this amazing website uh, by Kevin Cowtan that I just love. It has all sorts of pictures of um, of real space objects, such as this duck. And he shows you what their Fourier transforms are, and he shows you these other very surprising um, properties of Fourier transforms. So that's, that's a fun thing to look at. But I just wanted to make the point that you can represent the original 2D object um, with another two dimensional thing that you can plot. So this is the real space image, and this is what we would call the image of the Fourier domain um, here. But what we do with the CMB is we don't bother making this most of the time. We don't bother making an image in the in two dimensions, but instead we just um, look at the length. So we just consider the, the how the length in, in KY and the length in KX, and that's what we plot on the x-axis. So now I'm going to show you doing that. How and we call that a power spectrum. You also square it for those of you who are stickler. So it's not just the coefficient like a k is the square. Um, so we make these simplifications. We always we almost always ignore the phase, and we only consider that length of the wave vector. And um, I wanted to show you some simple images and their Fourier transform, their power spectrum. So this is something where there's only one interesting length scale. And that's the radial distance between the rings. And in, in that case, you get only one peak over here in the power spectrum. So there was only that one interesting scale. And if I make the um, rings closer together, that, that turns out to move you to a larger value on the x-axis here, if you just compare. Um, and that will persist when we look at the power spectrum for the CMB. So, um, uh, Large, uh, large sizes show up on the left in the Fourier transform domain, and small sizes show up on the right. Uh, and then here's a pattern where there are a couple of interesting length scales. There's the size of the square, and there's the size of the diagonal, and so forth. And you end up getting multiple peaks um, when you have that checkerboard pattern. Um, and then you can just generically do this for other two-dimensional images. So. Here's a two-dimensional image that's kind of boring, kind of like, you know, a person might have thought the CMB images were boring until you tried to be this point A stuff. Um, and, but this is a, is typical of a natural scene in which there is not much that's particularly interesting in the power spectrum. Um, your eye can see that there is some sort of big feature here, you know, it goes white, dark, white, dark. And so that leads to there being the power spectrum being kind of high at the large scales and then getting smaller as you go down. Um, and okay, so that's the that's the power spectrum of it. 
And then I did the, the following thing, which is um, I said, oh, well, what if you start with that same power spectrum and then you generate an image from it, only now you do something really special and particular with that phase thing. And this is what you get. <laughs> That's our former president, Shirley Tillman. And of course, actually I started by going from here to here and ignoring the phase that made uh, her look so lovely there. And then I generated this image from, from um, Phase matters, but most of the time in the CMB, it seems like it really, really doesn't. And we actually look, there's many complicated reasons, uh, but we actually look very carefully at phase. Um, and actually the very last slide I'm gonna show you here, if you really were gonna be a stickler, you could argue with me that it came almost entirely considering the phase, but I'm not gonna describe it that way. Okay. So this is what happens. This is why that was all worth it, even those of you who thought it was boring. It's totally worth it because you take this two-dimensional image in space, and then you look at its power spectrum, and holy heck, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's like it's got this structure that with your eye, you're like, oh, it's got a few features, a few features. It's not that gobbledygook of the of Shirley when I took her power spectrum. It, it doesn't, it has. You know, you could say it's got, uh, you know, it looks like it's got about five or six peaks in it. They are not all the same height as each other um, and so forth. And that is so awesome because we're, we um, understand enough about the origin of the CMB that we could predict that it might have some sort of interesting patterns. And the fact that it, that it seems to show a relatively small number of features means that we can model what's going on there just in terms of really interesting fundamental parameters of the universe, like uh, what is the density of matter today? We have to run it backwards because we really care about what was the density of matter back then? You know, what were, what were the amount of, uh, uh, what did the initial uh, random fluctuation look like? Uh, how many variants were there back then? And you can pull all, all of that information out because it looks so beautiful in the way of Okay. Um, and, and, you know, whenever people give any talk on cosmology, they'll, they almost always show a picture of the power spectrum of the CMB. And this is not even the best one. Oh, but, I, but the reason I'm showing it is because it very kindly, it has this, <laughs> wave vector thing, the Fourier uh, variable on the bottom, but up here it's showing you the size scales. So large angular scales, like 90 degrees, and okay, so I'm going to go to this. Okay, so from that we get this universal pie chart that tells us what fractions of the energy density in the universe come from which sources. And there are some other uh, contributors, like the, the leftover, the CMB itself contributes some energy density, but it's just really small compared to anything else on this chart. Neutrinos contrib contribute a little bit. Um, and so this, this combined with looking at data from the supernovae uh, uh, is where we come up with this concept that the ordinary matter in the universe, the variance and whatnot, is only four or five percent. There's a lot of dark matter that interacts gravitationally, but even it is just a small fraction of the total energy pie. And we think the rest of the energy pie is in this form uh, creatively called dark energy. Um, so that's, um, this is the sort of top level amazing thing you get out of um, analyzing that power spectrum of the CMB. Um, okay, one more instrument interlude. I am cognizant of the time and I'm not going to go on very much longer. Um, and that is a, a little discussion of what types of instruments are used to measure the CMB. So um, because the atmosphere of our Earth is quite full of water, um, and you may know that um, your microwave, for example, your microwave oven is really good at heating up water. That's because water absorbs microwaves, and things that absorb microwaves also emit microwaves. Both of those things are extremely aggravating when you're trying to measure the um, microwave 
background um, and you have to look through atmosphere. So there have been these series of three uh, amazing satellites that um, uh, made observations of the CMB and then also some really cool um, balloon board instruments. So this balloon board instrument spider, the person running it is Bill Jones, who's a, my colleague in the physics department. Um, but if you're stuck on Earth, you would like to go someplace that is also high and dry. And there are kind of two classic places where um, uh, that where, where the well, okay, the, the South Pole is not actually high, but it's uh, it's extremely dry. So the South Pole has an extremely dry climate. It's also got lots of interesting properties because you know southern Alaska uh, has twilight, but boy. The South Pole has, you know, full time daylight for half the year and full time night for the other half of the year, roughly speaking. And that means that everything is very um, uh, stable. So once it's been dark for 10 days, uh, um, fluctuations uh, um, really slow down. Um, and the other place is the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, that's where all the instruments I work on are. So I'm really. Uh, um, um, love it. It is exceedingly dry. Our instruments are up at 17,000 feet. So you're both above a lot of the atmosphere. And also it is just uh, from a weather perspective, a dry region anyway, it's a desert. And so this is the ACT um, instrument. So the T in ACT stands for telescope, but I still always call it ACT telescope. I apologize for being annoying. Um, but it's made out of 72 metal panels. It has a secondary mirror here, and then the camera sits right here. These are our colleagues of ours have this um, set of three telescopes called the Simons Array. There are other colleagues of ours um, have uh, another instrument called CLASS. So this is a six meter telescope. These are two and a half meter. CLASS is only half a meter in size. And then there's this uh, 10 meter telescope in the South Pole. And also at the South Pole, there are these other series of half meter telescopes. Um, and I will get to why in just a minute. A little bit more on, on ACT since it's my telescope. So um, ACT, uh, that's the mirror that you saw before. This is the mirror sort of by the side. Here's the so-called ray trace. So light comes in, hits the primary mirror, goes running over to the secondary, and then into the camera, which is a cryogenic camera. Um, the camera sits inside this receiver cabin. And then the whole thing sits inside this gigantic ground screen. Um, and that's because the Earth itself is emitting sort of kind of black body radiation of order at, at a temperature that's uh, closer to room temperature, which is closer to 300 Kelvin than 3 Kelvin. So even if a little bit of its emission gets into your camera, it's um, it's large and so it can cause you a problem. Um, I found this street art um, online uh, uh, by Stick, and I love it because it represents past, present, and future. And I have really sad news here, which is that uh, Act is now in the past. We uh, have been over the last um, summer, we've been taking it down and we're working on donating it to an observatory associated with a small university in Chile. And so it is not there, it is past. These other instruments are um, building, but then I'm also involved with this Simons Observatory instrument, which is almost completely finished. And by April, we expect it to be fully running. So at that point, I'll have to move it over into the front and get it out of the future column. And then there's another gigantic effort um, called CMBS4 that may happen in the future. Um, so just a teeny bit more on Simon's Observatory. Um, it has, uh, I, I showed you only the big telescope in the previous slide. So it's also a six meter telescope. But okay, for you, telescope geeks, this is amazing because it has a, a, a six meter primary mirror sit, sitting here, and you can only kind of see it by edge. Um, but its secondary mirror is essentially the same size. They're both very close to six meters. 
And that's this um, design that's sometimes called the cross dragoni design um, that allows you to have, they're both uh, concave, and it allows you to have a really enormous um, focal plane where everything is still in focus. And when I say enormous, I it's around three meters. I, I can't do three meters, but you know, it's around three meters, um, the focal plane. And um, we're only using about two and a half meter um, diameter of the focal plane because there's only so much money in the world for building here. <laughs> so, um, and then we also have these three small aperture telescopes. This is showing the cryostat. They're conventional telescopes. <laughs> They just have three lenses in them, so we get we keep the whole thing completely cold, at, um, like below one Kelvin, and it it will be mounted inside on this platform, um, and uh, we actually have one of the three mounted already, but I forgot to pull down the, the brain temperature. Okay, so why so many more instruments? Why two sizes? Well, it's basically because there are different types of questions you could ask. So the small, small, small size telescope is designed to let you go after this epic of inflation in the early, early universe um, for looking for these things called primordial gravitational waves. Um, and uh, I could tell you in a sidebar why you want a small instrument for that, but it's basically because the signature of those primordial gravitational waves is um, understood that it would show up at really large angles. So you don't have to have a giant telescope if you're going to look at something at really low resolution. And if you make the telescope physically small, then you can shield it really, really well. well so. And then the big telescopes. I have a bunch of slides on that that I'm not going to show you because it's late and you're tired. But um, the, the big telescope has very high <laughs> angular resolution. And what ends up happening in that, oh, not how cool that slide is. Well, what ends up happening when you have really high resolution, this is a picture of, of the CMB as it travels uh, forward um, <laughs> through the universe toward us right now. And what, what's happening is that as the CMB photons have to travel through time, they're also they're traveling through the epoch in which all these big structures like galaxies and clusters of galaxies were forming under gravitational collapse. And so at the beginning, when people first started looking at the CMB, they ignored those details. They're like, oh, all that cluster in the way it's really the, the, all that structure in the way it's really small. So as long as we look at bigger features in the CMB, you can ignore it, which is true. But um, it, then it starts to be, you know, um, one man's fish is another man's poison, or other way around, good way. One man's poison is another man's fish. So when you start looking at, at the really small angular scale, high resolution images, all of this collapsing structure starts to put imprints and, and, and fingerprints on your data, and then you can use that to understand the universe, not, not just when it was um, in that primordial period where it was only 400,000 years old, but also get information about all the growth of structure in that time in between. It's kind of heavy um, how exciting it is. And one thing that I had put here was, this is the energy chart that we think is true now, but the CMB is coming back from this time period, and we actually think that the energy chart then looked completely different. Um, so baryons uh, were a larger fraction of the whole pie, even though it's the same, same baryons then as now. Um, the neutrinos had a huge contribution to the pie. The photons, meaning the CMB itself, was a big contributor. And then dark matter made up all the rest. And then at some point around redshift of, ooh, a few dark energy started coming in and dark energy, all the rest of the energy densities, they dilute away as the energy get up, as the universe expands, it gets bigger and bigger. And dark energy is so, so strange because it does not dilute away. So you go from your, 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 when you look at these, at the CMB, um, then compared to now, there's just this gigantic change in the universal conditions. So it's really cool to look at these small, um, 
high angular resolution features because you know you get the information during all the crazy time when things were changing. So um, why do I have this again? Oh yes, just one teeny thing. I, I promised I would show you something newish, or I promised Victor I'd show you something newish. And so ACT, yes, it's in the past, but it still has a bunch of, um, we're gonna release a lot more data um, um, and we're not done with that, but we call the next data release, data release six. And we've, we've done the first increment of data release six. And here are a bunch of cool people right here in front of the physics building actually, um, uh, who are part of ACT. And uh, the, the thing that we, we released recently was the so-called mass map, okay? And so this is these beautiful graphics that the Simons Foundation uh, made for us, because uh, we have gone over to our of the Simons Foundation. And so here's a way that you can think about it. Einstein said that um, uh, the existence of matter could distort the path light. So um, matter can bend space-time and then photons travel the along these things called geodesics, which means they conform to what space-time is doing. Sorry I'm talking so long, but I just want to remind you that you all know all about this because you've all been to one of those museums where you put a quarter in the yellow funnel that represents the black hole, and that that funnel is representing the way space-time is distorted around a black hole, hole, and the quarter is showing you the way a photon would travel um, around the black hole. So th this is a similar type of depiction. So there's matter in the way. So this is, um, well, this is showing a distant object, matter distorts the light path, and that means that when you observe, when you try to look back at this, <clears throat> say really um, simple pattern of a checkerboard because the light doesn't go from say that black square and end up in the black square or white square and end up in the white square and instead it travels these distorted paths the image that you get is is distorted and so in the same way even though we don't know exactly what the patterns of the cmd were it's still true that um, the light is getting bent around like around 50 times on average. The typical photon is deflected a little bit around 50 times as it tries to travel across that whole stretch of universe to us. And there are these really fun math tricks that involve Fourier space and they involve phase and they involve all sorts of stuff that lets you um, understand how much uh, the, on average, the signal is being distorted, and, and you can actually translate um, the information that you get into a, a two dimensional map of how much mass there was in any one pathway from here to here. And um, this is the ACT ER6 CMB lensing map. Um, of these uh, purple and yellow spots showing where there was more or less um, mass, of mass in the universe. And that, that you may think, oh, is that exciting or not? And one of the reasons it's really exciting is because then there are lots of optical surveys that can give you similar types of information, but not from as far back. So then when you compare the recent to the far back, you can understand how um, the structure has changed. So, right, CMB is really bright, future backends, you know, future so bright, I gotta leave the clear <laughs> shades. And that's the end. And thank you so much. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I've been assured that we have gotten rid of the um, offending. Uh, yes, and so, and my wife is saying that it has been quiet, and I will turn the speaker back on, and I'm going to grab this and ask somebody to point it or whatever, pass it around to. Actually, I have a question. Uh, early on, we made sort of a, a conceptual leap between the power spectrum of the CMB 
and this pie chart. Uh, you left my cognitive abilities in, you know, in the dust with that. Can you explain how you got to want to do that? Yes, I mean, not fully, but partially. So um, we think that we understand a lot about um, what was happening in the plasma at the time that the CMB decoupled. And in particular, we understand um, we understand that there was what people often just call sound waves, but there were there were um, oscillations in the plasma where photons and matter were. Uh, it, it wasn't saying staying a constant density, but instead there was motion, which is similar to sound, um, where where you know my voice going to your ear is rarefying and causing to be dense the air in between us. And so we understand why we think that we, we have a model for how those processes happen. And the model is relatively simple. And so it relies on um, understanding the uh, initial fluctuations, which is the term we use to say that somehow, and it's very mysterious how and we're all excited to understand it, but somehow, the initial um, distribution of, of matter as a function of position in the universe was not uniform. It was slightly non-uniform. When I say slightly, I mean like part of a, a, a million or less. Um, so the, the, we can predict that the power spectrum will depend on how slightly uniform it, and uniform it was. And then it will depend on um, the amount of matter density, because as these oscillations happen, kind of the speed and um, uh, rate at which they happen is related to how much plasma, how much it weighs, how much it, it weighs as you're dragging it around and causing it to oscillate. And also, uh, for an additional reason, it, it'll depend not only on how much dark matter there is, but also, um, how many of the baryons, the ordinary um, protons and electrons there are. And the reason for that is actually kind of cool. It's because uh, the plasma is the photons and the electrons and the, and the protons. And so it's the thing that's awesome. But uh, because the protons have mass, there's an underlying distribution of dark matter and so the protons care about the fact that um, they're gravitationally attracted to the places where there's more dark matter. So you have this motion that's going on that depends both on how the, the dark matter, like potential wells, how big these sources are of gravitational attraction. It depends on how many baryons there were. It depends on the initial fluctuations and it depends on only one or two other things. And from just assuming that that's what's going on, but not knowing the sizes of all of those things, you can make a uh, prediction that you would get, it's gonna be a minute, but you can get predictions that you would get oscillations like this. And so then you look at the actual data and you say, yep, it's, um, you know, it has these certain properties that tells me uh, um, about, uh, those different things in the pie chart. And there's one thing that you're still frowning at me, so that wasn't good. But, um, <laughs> I was going to show you this no, thing. Friends. So one of the one of the things that's required has to do with this whole concept of critical density. So with from Einstein's equations, we know that there's this critical density. Um, which if that is what our universe has, a critical amount of energy per volume, then the space-time would need to be flat, um, according to Einstein's um, um, uh, equations. And so uh, what you can see um, in this picture, I'm going to go to, uh, it's going to take me two steps, but what you can see in this picture um, is showing what that means in terms of how light would propagate through the universe, depending on whether the universe was flat, the thing that's easy to imagine, or if the universe had a positive curvature, two lines that started out parallel would eventually intersect. And if it has negative curvature, it's sort of the opposite pattern. Um, and so, uh, 
And by the way, the flat universe, the negative curvature universe, they're both infinite in, in extent. And so um, what this picture is showing is that um, the first peak in the power spectrum, which is the same thing as the dominant sized pattern that your eye sees when you look at something like this, how where that shows up, how big the, those features are, is related to whether the universe is flat or not. Okay, sidebar. Once you know the universe is flat, you know that all of the that pi has to add up to the critical density. So it gives you this extra piece of information that lets you make the pi. And it and as you can see from the bottom line here, the CMB agrees very, very well with the situation that the universe is flat. But here, here's the thing. Bear with me. We think we understand so much about what's going on in that early plasma that we understand the physical size, like measured in kilometers, of what the standard blob size would be or where that first peak in the CMB. We think we really understand how big that should be. And so we, in other words, we think we know the length of this yellow bar, okay? But we're measuring it on the celestial sphere, so we're measuring it as an angle. And so that's what's the, um, uh, that's what we're trying to show here. So uh, th there's a triangle that has uh, that has you know one leg of the triangle is how far away the CMB is from here, and then another leg is how big the blobs look on the CMB. And if the um, universe is flat, you draw the triangle looking like this. And if the universe is open, you'd, you'd have to squish the sides in this manner. And if it's closed, you'd, you'd like bow them out in that manner. And it would end up being that, that, that the feature size would be, you know, Goldilocks just right, this middle size if the universe is flat. The feature size would look small if you're in this open state, and they would look bigger if you're in this closed state. And so we can measure that first peak in the CMB really, 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 really well. It's, it's insane how well we measure. And um, from that measurement, we know that that um, the uh, we, we believe that the universe um, is flat. And so that's like that's the thing that I'm probably best to explain. How do you? <laughs> I have a related but slightly different question. Later on, you have a picture of uh, the cosmic background, uh, uh, cosmic microwave background, with intervening matter that's distorting the path mm -hmm. of the photon. Mm -hmm. And is that where the polarization comes from, the distortion of? of the background from the intervening stuff. No, but that I, I can see where you might have um, thought of that. What what happens is so light being polarized, um, if you want to think about it in terms of electric fields, do you? So light being polarized, you can think of light as an electromagnetic disturbance that involves oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And so light being polarized means like when, when you receive, um, when you use a radio antenna to receive a signal, old fashioned radio antennas more or less just look like a stick. And so what happens is you stick your antenna, your dipole antenna out and a radio wave hits that antenna and it has an oscillating electric field, which causes a voltage that causes current to flow in the antenna. That's how you detected the signal. Okay, so the the antenna is is as you some of you are of my vintage, and so you might remember TV antennas where you had to like <laughs> wiggle them around, and that's because the <laughs> exactly that's partially because the signals were polarized. So you were trying to get your antenna set up so that the it would be um, good at finding the direction of polarization. Okay, so blah, blah, blah. So it turns out that this process here doesn't change the polarization at all, but 
the primordial patterns of the polarization that we think would indicate whether or not you have primordial gravitational waves, those patterns don't stay the same pattern for the same reason checkerboard didn't become this checkerboard. Now the, the pattern of polarization um, also gets distorted, even though the gravitational, this is called gravitational lensing, even though this effect didn't change the polarization. The way the CMB gets polarized, oh, I have so many slides on that that I often yeah, choose to talk about. But it's the same reason, so you may not have known this, but it's the it's it's related to the reason that you wear polarized sunglasses when you go skiing or when you go out on a lake. And that's because the the reason you get a lot of glare off light that um, comes in and glances off the surface of the lake. Um, and it turns out that a lot of that glare is polarized because the process of the light scattering off a very asymmetric thing, like the lake, the lake is only in one plane, um, causes the light to be polarized by, by a sort of well-known effect. And so in the, and you can tell this because, you know, you can take polarized sunglasses and then like turn your head like this and and similarly, this is my favorite one to say, but light, um, light gets polarized in our atmosphere as well. So light from the sun, uh, if you turn, if the sun is here and you turn and look over sort of opposite the sun here, uh, you'll see the same polarized effect on a bright day. So you take your head with polarized sunglasses and turn it by 90 degrees and you'll see that it's um, less, because the sun, is the, you'll see that it's polarized. The sun is a great example of an anisotropic source of light. So um, in the plasma, the early plasma, there's some non-uniformity in the plasma. And um, that the, as the CMB photons do their blast scatter off an off a, um, electron in that plasma, they can become slightly polarized in that process. That's where the polarization let me uh, ask them. Thanks. Um, I was wondering when the telescope or antenna is pointed at the sky and receiving cosmic background radiation, how much, you know, at the wavelength that you're actually observing, how much of it is actually cosmic background radiation? How much is something else that came from some other place? Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends on exactly what frequency band we're observing in. So, and so we often just describe the atmosphere emission in also in units of Kelvin. So the CMB is three Kelvin. And at like 90 gigahertz, which is where we do a lot of our observations, at these very great sites like the Atacama Desert, the CMB, sorry, the atmosphere contributes about five Kelvin. And so the total amount of signal you get is almost half and half. Um, and at lower frequencies, the atmosphere contributes even less. So it, it can be the case that about that more than half your signal is from the CMB. At higher frequencies, the atmosphere has more and more contribution. And so it becomes a smaller and smaller. Or are there other things? I mean, outside in space, are there clouds of gas or dust? Or oh, things in the galaxy so that are like also emitting, you know, that are around that temperature anyway? Absolutely. And so um, we call those foregrounds, and we spend a lot of time trying to remove them from the maps, which you do by having data from different um, different frequencies. So one of the big things, really big things that happens is our own galaxy has dust in it. And the dust is like itty bitty little almost black bodies. So it emits um, radiation according to its temperature. And its temperature is like around 20 Kelvin. And so we see those signals. And going back to sort of Victor's question, the dust grains, and by the way, Bruce Drain here, total expert on this invented um, most of our knowledge in this area. Um, the little dust grains um, are not round. Uh, they're like ovules. And 
when they're in a magnetic field, they can start spinning and then um, uh, it, and also they align themselves with the magnetic field. And that leads to them being able to not just emit some, have some of their light be polarized, but in addition, it can be polarized um, in, a, in patterns that have to do with, with the magnetic field in our galaxy. And that, led to the 2014 catastrophe that all of us in CMB are still trying to live through, which is that um, in 2014, some colleagues of ours who were working at the South Pole thought that they had detected these primordial gravitational waves. It was an above the fold story in the New York Times uh, before any paper had actually been published. And it turned out that what they were seeing was was this polarized galactic dust emission from our own galaxy. So yeah, so dust, it's mostly stuff in our galaxy contributes in a way that is confusing for us. There's also synchrotron emission, which is what happens when electrons um, spiral around magnetic field lines. They emit light that can show up in the microwave frequencies. And then on a much smaller scale, we can see things like active galactic nuclei and other sources of radio and, um, and uh, microwave and infrared emission, but they're point like they're sources. So we can figure out that it's there by going to look at some catalog and then just ignore it in our data. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, I got two questions. The first one's rather quick. Oh, um, what was the initial genome genetic reason that was? Oh, that's a close one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the there's <coughs> much debate, <coughs> including locally, where we have um. Uh, Paul Steinhardt, who was one of the first people who invented the most, the theory, which is the easiest explanation for that. He helped invent it, but he, he helped work on it in the early days. And now he, he understands all of his blemishes very well. And he um, uh, has alternate theories. But let me tell you about that, the most common theory, which is this theory um, that Victor mentioned at the beginning called which says that early on in the universe, by which I mean 10 to the minus you know, 52 seconds ago or some really small time, the universe um, started expanding um, faster than the speed of light. And um, it had an exponential expansion that caused it to be that it was expanding faster than the speed of light. That's actually allowed by Einstein's law. So um, two objects um, uh, themselves cannot travel faster than the speed of light, but you could have the like coordinate system defined by space time itself stretching about a part faster than the speed of light. And what that means is that some sort of little teeny tiny um, difference in density in two spots um, could be uh, stretched to physically enormous light scales by that rapid expansion. And so what we, the most likely explanation would be that there were some quantum fluctuations in the early universe, which occurred only on teeny tiny scales, but then this epoch of inflation happened, brought them to macroscopic scales, and there we are. And um, so that is the answer to that question, but it's uh, the theory of inflation itself is not a singular theory. You have to put in a number of elements. We haven't found one that explains all evidence. It's more like this construct that's able to represent. So that would be on the fluctuation before or at the moment of the onset. Correct. Correct. Okay, yeah. and then my second question is, um, apparently the universe Universe's expansion was slowing down for its first 9 billion years of planet, and for the last 5 billion years has been on this phenomenon of expansion. 
has been uh, speeding up. And as I understand, you theorize that as the matter distribution fell for a certain threshold, then a uh, certain property of the space itself, the way with dark energy, then superseded the effect of gravity. But well, matter has to be far away. So that doesn't account for what caused the start of inflation, though, which is seems to be something related in that um, you know expansion took off at a domestic rate, but the, the density that density was very high at that point. So is this a different phenomenon? And it seems that both are related to properties of space itself. Uh, if you look at the like, virtual particle pair formation and gravitational lensing, it seems that space is some stuff that we don't know what it is, but it has properties. Is that a fair statement? And so what caused it to be in the Um so let's see, there are several things in there. One is I completely agree that the dark energy now is seemingly somehow related to inflation. And in fact, when people try to model both of them, they start with the same physics principle, which is they say, oh, the universe was filled with a scalar field. And you may be thinking, I've never heard of a scalar field, but you have, because remember when uh, in Europe, they discovered the Higgs boson, it was a really gigantic big deal. Um, the Higgs boson was an example of a scalar particle. And so in both cases, there is this relationship that you need the same type of phenomenon. Uh, when people first invented the concept of inflation, no scalar field had ever been measured because this Higgs boson was only discovered in the last 10 years. Um, and so it's a, it's a very weird premise. So that was your, one thing you said was, are they related? Oh, and then you were saying the thing about uh, um, dark energy became important and caused the um, accelerated expansion of the universe only relatively recently. Yeah, that is um, fair. It's tied up with uh, Einstein's equations again, which by the way, once I was in small world, like 10 years ago before everyone had a tattoo and I saw a kid who had Einstein's equations tattooed on the um, But uh, uh, it's very tied up with, with Einstein's it, it falls out of Einstein's equations that if you suddenly added uh, a scalar field that had dark energy, that you would get that potential. So the two things are quite related. And then your thing of like the universe is made, you know, we don't really understand space time. Well, A, that's probably true, but B, it might, you might be conflating it just a tiny bit of we don't understand what stuff is in the universe. because. As I say, oh, we sort of understand it if we say that space time is busy obeying Einstein's laws and thus general relativity, but it has this scalar field in it. So I put my lack of understanding as the scalar field, not as the space time. But I mean, you know, it's similar to what you said that there's a lack of understanding. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's like really the change. It's scalar field, but we don't have scalar field. Correct. But last thing, which I don't expect any to take it on, it's a problem. Uh, there's no to be a dichotomy between gravity and fourth force that somehow fitted with the standard model with uh, distortion of space time by mass. And, and so we've got a gravity, okay, so we've got two models. And, and I'm not talking about. Um, very small those numbers, very large and long properties space time versus forces say the model picture of Well, it is a giant puzzle to how to bring those two sectors uh, into alignment with each other. And it's actually the, uh, you know, one of the main reasons that string theory was invented ages ago 
And now um, people are feeling less confident that string theory is going to be able to bring everything together. And there's now um, a certain group of people who are turning their attention um, to trying, I would say very roughly speaking, trying to um, really understand how quantum mechanics interacts with gravity in general. But you're right, it's a huge time. It's things that Hawkins and Penrose also work on. So it is a it is a huge um, puzzlement, and you are right that we're not gonna figure it out. So I'm gonna take the prerogative of calling this so all this fascinating discussion, but I think in fairness to all of us and our speakers, especially we should probably call a halt to it. Fantastic talk. We thank you for coming here tonight. Thank and you. maybe one night change. Thank you. To get from Amazon or otherwise, it summarizes sort of where where you think the theories really lie. Is there a argument? I mean, and here's why it's tough because two of my favorite colleagues in the physics department have two separate books, Ryman Page and Joe Duckley, um, and they're very on very different axes. But if you look up those two books, Lyman Page's is very focused on um, the history of the CMB. Oh, and then my third favorite colleague, Jim Peebles. His last book, okay, I'm going to have to go with Jim Peebles' last book. Jim Peebles' last book is amazing. Um, Thank yeah. you. Go for that. Great. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this last uh, summer we went to two star parties. The first one was uh, Cherry Spring, not Cherry Spring, it's a stellar thing. Cherry Spring was great, it actually um, got dark and the uh, wind stopped a bit. and. Uh, you think everything's going to be wonderful, but the, as the sun went down, it got darker and darker. Of course, the smoke was totally up in the sky, and you actually saw almost the, the same as what you can see in the backyard in Princeton, which is not very much. So that was a bit of a washout. Um, and, and I would say I've only been to the uh, Cherry Spring once. It's certainly more of an observing uh, star park. Whereas Stella Fame, this is just a general shot of the uh, hill that's called in the Stella Fame, where you have the quarter telescope in that dome up in that shed. Um, and gathered on this particular site, it's actually a very big site. Uh, it's just one small portion of it. Um, you have a group of uh, telescope makers, and it's been going 100 years. It's got the 100th year anniversary of Stella Fame. And um, as you can see, there's just a lot of, lot of telescopes brought to the site. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of interesting people. And, um, you know, you just talk and you show your stuff off, and it's just a, a nice thing to do. So now, here's the next slide. is a book that says 100 years of stellar plate. Um, this year, I brought uh, this sort of six inch binocular, um, reflecting binocular. So it's twin Newtonian telescopes were stacked in a certain way to bring the five pieces together. And the other thing I brought was uh, this device that's actually here. Um, and it's, um, it's a 3D printed uh, 7 by 50, it can be 15 by 50, can change the magnification with it. What I really use it for is finding the object. So this, we often use it putting the finder on the main telescope, which is actually quite awkward to look through. It's, Depends on the angles of the telescope, especially if it's on there filming up. Um, so this is a completely sort of remote finder. So what this is, you've got to make the binoculars comfortable. Because the only way to make binoculars comfortable, in my opinion, is to have right angle um, eyepieces, because then you can look at the zenith quite easily and everything just fits together. But you, you can't buy this particular size, you can buy large binocular telescopes um, <laughs> with um, right angle eyepieces, but they tend to be very expensive uh, in the sort of thousand, ten thousand range. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody thinks this, this size is commercially viable. But with 3D printing, it's really quite simple to, to construct something like this that can change the inter eye distance. And with a couple of adjustment screws, it's very easy to collimate the two images. So, what this enables you to do then is to look at the sky, the Princeton area, instead of being, you know, 
just about seeing the summer triangle if you're lucky, a good night. You can go down the seventh magnitude stars on any night. It's obviously clear and there's no smoke in the sky. If you <laughs> but what you have here is a running planetary map. And they, there's a lot of activity sometimes. If you just sort of handhold a phone, you, they're just useless. I mean, they could kind of say, well, it's Venus maybe. But they are extremely accurate if you calibrate on a nearby bright star and you've got to have a, a planetary map that has certain features this is sky guide and you've got to be able to change the compass and you've got to be able to change the vertical position so it's very easy to calibrate that image here so you've got say arcturus in the in the eyepieces and then you just make sure arcturus is right in the middle of your um, display and I put this little door in front just to cover up the screen so that you have exactly a six and a half degree field here and a six and a half degree field in the eyepieces. So when you and you and plate solving is the buzzword of a lot of the electronic uh, devices these days they solve the image of the stars in the sky and the brain is very good at that um, so that when you start to see little asterisms and, and different uh, patterns of the sky field here, it's very easy to pick it up also in the eyepieces. So you can tune in quite quickly to where this circle of stars is exactly the same as what you see here. So then you know, because you've put in the database, you know, you, your galaxy or your invisible object is in the middle of that star field. And then all you do is you match the two star fields and now you plate solve the system. You turn on the laser, which is right in the, aimed at the middle of the field. So now you go to your main telescope and you can just obviously pick up the laser in the sky extremely quickly, just with a red dot finder. And, you, and your main telescope is then pointed at the galaxy uh, or anything else that you wanted to find. The lasers I use here are the quantum dot lasers. They're direct, yeah. direct drive lasers, which aren't lightsabers from uh, you know Star Wars. They are just quite dim. They're four milliwatts. They're totally legal. They don't emit any infrared. Um, they're not super bright, but they're certainly bright enough to pick it up in the sky. And um, so that's you know completely taking the finder out of the main telescope and putting it into a what I feel is a much more convenient package. So very quickly, mind you, these. So here's the setup on our deck. You have the finder there and you have a, you know, your bigger telescope sort of next to it. And you just kind of find something and then you look at the uh, laser in the sky and see the object if you're lucky. In Princeton, you don't, um, you know, just outside. We live um, in Montgomery Township, Mon <coughs> just outside of north of Princeton. And uh, this guy is pretty poor most of the time, unfortunately. So that's the device there. And, well, I can't quite see that. What you're seeing, this is actually an image. This image over this side would be what you see through the eyepiece. And that image is what would be in the um, uh, planetary map. And if you took that off there so you could see them clearly, you can actually pick up every single star there. This is M42, obviously a very easy thing to, object to find. But every star there is on that image there. And you can easily match the two, um, knowing that you're then um, pointing the object you want. You turn on your laser, that would be the image that you see in the eyepieces. Um, this is kind of awkward without, you know, thank you. So you can see, if we had a laser point, I could just, you can see the three stars at the top of the, just vaguely top left of it. And those two images are easy to match with the brain. Um, and you can you know, find things in the sky. So that's what I've been doing this summer, basically, um, <laughs> trying to uh, make simple things. If yeah, anyone's interested- Your cell phone up and taking the image through the Yes, that was right. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, the files are all available. Um, who, anybody who has a 3D printer who would like to, I mean, personally, I find that any binocular that isn't a minimum 45 degree eyepiece is kind of okay, but they still get crick in the neck and give you a backache. Um, and, and being on a lounge chair, it's all wobbly and 
it, it's they're not really very useful until you can mount them and have them in a comfortable format with 90 degree eyepieces. So 3D printing really does lend itself to making uh, devices like this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I heard it directly that you won a prize. Oh, uh, well, not not this year. No, oh. last year I, oh, I, I won some prize, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the very first time I did win um, back in 1995, in fact, um, loads of years ago. And it happens when we play for about 30 years, and um, 45 years. That's terrific. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, for some reason, it's important. Okay, so now moving along, uh, asking all of you, what did you do this summer? What do you have cool to share? So, Tom had a little experience. Uh, I'm trying to bring this up full screen. Hang on, Tom. You, you're going to tell us about what you did. Um, if I can get it. Now I've lost my cursor. Are you going to stay there, Tom? Or are you going to get it? Are you going to stay there? Um, no. I'll just give you this. Because, right. <laughs> you know, the, the people outside are yeah, the thing. One is here. Okay. <laughs> so can I do this? Yes, I think so. And then, Tom, you want to come up here? Are we ready? Tell us what you were up to. We're ready. Well, I think so. Good. Okay. So, <laughs> um, back in August, middle of August, I was testing a telescope I've been struggling with for about the last 15 years. Finally got it collimated, finally got it actually aligned, finally got everything working, and the lens group aligned. And I figured at the same time, I was also um, testing my AZMP mount, which I'd replaced the bearings in. And so set everything up and I was just poking around, just doing some testing. And I figured, oh, look, oh, that's neat. Look, I need some, I looked at some fuzzy hydrogen stuff that wasn't cutting the mustard really. What I really wanted to find out is like how well the mount was tracking. So I figured, oh, Cygnus. Oh, look, there's M39, nice open cluster, bright, relatively bright stars. If I'm getting distortion by the mount moving or the not collimated right i'll see it evidently so in sky safari i go m39 and there's this big white streak right through the middle of m39 and i'm going what the heck is that <laughs> well that happened to be c 2023 e1 atlas so i said oh i'll take a picture of it so i'm trying to advance come on now there so that's what I yep, was doing. That's what you just said, yeah. So then what I did, that now this next image, the next image is actually a great screen grab from Sky Safari, which I did after the fact. And I got it to approximately the same time that I took the first image. And if you can see, well, we need a pointer. We don't know how to leave the thing. There it is right there. That little blue dot is the comet. Wow, it's really green. Yeah, you can yeah. So then see if it the uh, advance will work. If not, we'll have to go to the other one. Oh, oh no. Okay, crash it. How, hold on. We're we're not out of the picture yet. And then oh, where is it? It's on it's in the full comet folder. Yeah, I'm not, I gotta find the, find the Yeah. Yeah, it's looking at hold on. My laptop. Oh, here we go. Thank you. No, no. I think sometimes we just push our uh, the limits of our laptops as we're going on. <laughs> uh, okay. And then it would be under. Oh, you know what? I've got Peter's You're looking in the wrong drive. Yeah, this is Peter's drive, I think. Oh, that would be a good Which I, I would return to Peter. Would you pass it up to Peter right? He's in the back row there. Sorry. Is it still your thumb in? drive, Peter? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Sorry about that, Tom. 
This thumb drive, by the way, I found in a athletic go. field with a metal detector. <laughs> and okay. I repurposed uh, it. And here we go. Finally got it. And then we're going to do this with yeah, uh, Windows. Right, that's right. it. There we go. Sorry for the... There we go. Yeah, good. Now we got to share it, can we? Well, it's rolling already. There you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. This is hard. This is one of those uh, circumstantial things. You know, it just happens. So, hey, go with it. Take some shots and see what happens. Now, at last. Okay. And That's the last screen. Share screen. This is hard, huh? Here. There it is. Oh, that's PowerPoint, sorry. Oh, that might be the PowerPoint. Windows Media Player. You see it? There it is. To the left, to the left. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. There. Is it? Yes, thank you. So there's the start, and there's the second frame, and there's the third frame. It's moved way out. All right. Unfortunately, I had it. a huge image scale shift. I had a do some equipment adjustment. So let's see if it works. Oh. <laughs> there we go. There's the first frame, second frame, and the fourth frame. You can see how far it's moved. So and this is a, minutes later. Minutes, yeah. There's the second one. Yeah. For some reason, it if the frames are identical, it doesn't show it as a different frame, but there it goes. And that was just the matter. So of this is minutes. 2023 Atlas Comet. Yeah, C2023 yeah? E1 Atlas. Very cool. And that's that's what I what one thing I did. Very good. You did it. Thank you, Tom. Cool. It was fun. An unexpected comment. All right. And here you go. Tom? Thank you. All right. So what else have we got? Other cool things? Before I get into uh, some outreach activities, anybody else want to share some uh, astro actions from the summertime? Well, let's see if I can share once again my slides. And then here we go. So, um, Bill Murray is. Um, fielding a lot of requests as our outreach chair um, for activities that are being lined up for the fall. And we're trying to get a little bit more membership involvement. And so there are a few slides here that summarize the requests that Bill has been working on. And we'd just like to get you guys to have a look at it. And as well, folks that are on the Zoom call, if you feel so inclined and you could help the club and help so the Rex, can I people make involved? a couple comments about these go, different go for it. Um, Okay, so uh, the uh, solar observing on the 16th, uh, that's members only for AAAP. If you're interested and you have a solar telescope or would like to look through one, come on out. Um, I have not sent uh, email to members yet. That will happen either late tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, so the the event on Friday, September 22nd, that's basically pretty simple. It's just a Boy Scout troop coming out to the observatory. Uh, it's going to be 8 to 12 scouts. We can take care of that with Team 3, but if you're interested, you can bring a scope out to help us out too. Um, the 23rd, um, the Mercer Meadows Rosedale Lake event. Uh, I have a good number of uh, uh, volunteers for that. Um, five or six so far. So we're doing the good if you're interested in helping out with that one coming out as well. Uh, for any of these, if you're interested, um, just email me, uh, info at princetonastronomy.org uh, and we'll set you up at one of these events. Um, the, can you scroll forward? Uh, Trying to. Having a little bit of a freeze up here. Come on. Right. Okay. Okay. So the uh, the Friday, September 29th event, uh, haven't gotten any volunteers for that yet. It's at the observatory. 
Um, so they're going to be okay, I think, with viewing through the telescopes. But they also want a couple of mini lessons for this Girl Scout troop, and the details are there. If you would feel like giving a mini lesson on some aspects of astronomy, and they're listed there for grade one to three and then four to six, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to tell the lady that uh, they're welcome to come out to the observatory, but we can't help them out with the, uh, the classes that they want for their merit badge. So you don't have any volunteers? We don't have yeah. any volunteers to do that. Just to be a really nice one to do if we could help. He's already got back to me with some of the events that he can attend. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, next one. Okay. So that's those are the two uh, observer uh, planetarium uh, observatory events that I run. So we're going to have groups coming out from the planetarium if the weather is clear. I do a, a short star talk for them starting at 730. And then whoever wants to come out, which generally ends up being somewhere between 20 and 30 people uh, to the observatory. It should, so the teams who are on those nights, just be aware that uh, you could have extra people coming out. And if I'm bringing people out, I will call the observatory to let you know. We can move forward. Okay. Um, so now we come into some of the things we need. So the, the weekend of the 13th, 14th of October is very busy. Um, so the 13th is the, the um, uh, Friday night observing event at the planetarium. The 14th, there are actually two events. So uh, that's the day of the uh, the annular solar eclipse. Um, it's going across the southeastern, southwestern United States. Um, but we're going to be doing solar observing at the planetarium. Uh, so if you have a telescope that can view the sun, uh, please contact me. Uh, we would love to have you out at the uh, planetarium. I already have one volunteer for that, um, but and I'm going to have two of my solar telescopes out there, but we could use other ones. I have a feeling that the crowd sizes could be kind of large. And we can't rely on the smoked particulates to filter the sun. No. <laughs> uh, so the evening of the 14th is uh, an event at the, uh, the Billy Johnson Mountain Lakes Nature Reserve in Princeton. This is by Princeton Open Space. So they would like uh, people to bring telescopes out there for viewing and somebody to give a 20-minute a sky talk, which I assume will be me. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a couple of volunteers for that, but we could use more. If somebody's interested in giving a talk, I mean, that we're all open for that. I think it'd be great if Bill did it, but if somebody else wanted to, mm -hmm. um, this is a great venue and it's a group we'd like to support kind of parallel to our own Hopewell open space group. So, uh, and it's a, and it's a cool venue. So anyway, go ahead, Bill. Um, so the, uh, the event on October 28th uh, is uh, the second event by the Mercer County Parks Commission also at Mercer Meadows. Um, that's their Halloween night hike and stargazing program. Uh, we have uh, several volunteers for that. So uh, we have enough people to staff it, but if you want to come out, that's fine. And then the Question last- Question on that, event, Bill, where do they locate the scope? Where do you locate the scope? So in? I'm not sure. The first one uh, by Rose, Rosedale Lake, I have not been to that event yet. They're going to send me directions. And as soon as I get them, I will send them to the volunteers. The link, there's a big open area. Yeah. And they'll be on the highest part of the uh, for the pole farm, uh, that's going in by, by the southern entrance of the park. Yeah. Um, on, what on they did last time, Federal City. There, there's a chain across the roadway there. Um, so you can only, there's like a parking area at the beginning and then a chain across the roadway going into the park. They took the chain down and allowed us to drive in, and there's a small little pavilion about a quarter of a mile in. Uh, the thing is set. built up on stilts, like, right? Is that right? Yeah. For an observing yeah. site? That was display of where the, all the antennas were. Right. These, uh, patio blocks. It was, so, it was, uh, so very cool. The elevated, uh, oh, okay. Uh, it was a flatter. And they have benches. 
Oh, I've been there. Yeah, it's a really cool venue too. Yeah. Great, well, great spot. Okay. Cool. Okay. And the last event so far, uh, which we could also use help with, is uh, I'm doing my annual uh, um, "How to Buy Your First Telescope" talk at the Planetarium on Saturday, November 25th, uh, at nine o'clock in the morning. That's the Saturday after Thanksgiving, so. Black Friday and the beginning of the shopping season. So people may be interested in buying a telescope. I would love to have several members come with their own telescopes, especially if it's a commercial telescope that's popular, like a C8 or small refractor, or maybe a small Dobsonian, and just set them up in the lobby of the planetarium so that people can talk to you. You can explain how your telescope works. You can explain what you like about it. You can explain what you don't like about it because I think that's what people want to hear. It's not really an observing event, it's talking about your equipment. And if you're interested in doing that, send me an email. What kind of age range have you seen? Like parents come to this as well as kids, right? It's families. Yeah. Usually people are coming to the planetarium show and, and if it, when it's advertised well, they'll, they'll come to the talk to learn about how to buy a telescope, but they actually want to see real telescopes too. Great, super. That's it for the events that I've been requested for so far. I have another group who wants um, some help. I'm not exactly sure when, I'm not exactly sure what they want, but I'm attending a Zoom meeting with them on Thursday morning and I'll hopefully get more information. Really great that we're getting hit up. I know it's a lot for members to contribute to, but it shows you we're getting our message out there and it shows you we can have an impact on people in our community. So it's a great thing. So thank you, Bill. Please respond to Bill if you can help out in any of these. Outreach at princetonastronomy.org is the email. So how are we doing, guys? Anybody have some things they want to share with the club? Yes? Am I hearing? All right, I'll share one with you. So I know we're going to talk about big refractors. Boy, I cannot get this. There we go, I keep losing the cursor. Yeah, so, sorry. Wesleyan University up in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, my wife and I had a chance to go up there this summer for a, a friend's kid's wedding. So it was the first time we'd been there, although I actually lived in Connecticut once in my life, but had never been here. So on the campus, I couldn't resist the day after the wedding. It, Carol and I went over to the campus and we're just strolling around and we found the astronomy department observatory. And this thing goes way back. It's like it's a time, a time capsule. It has a 20 inch, who thought, a 20 inch Alvin Clark refractor sitting in this old observatory in Middletown, Connecticut. And it's one of the classic ones, F 16 and a half. Um, there's a story about the lens and how it got ground. You can look it up if you're interested, but we couldn't resist getting our photo up here with the, with the big refractor. So these things never fail to impress when you see them up close and personal. And um, I won't say a lot more about that because I know one of our upcoming talks, I think you guys are gonna get into some of the famous refractors in the world, but also who can resist a real uh, library with its own ladder? So this is the way it used to be. And think about it. I mean, every university with an astronomy department would have something like this in the old days and all the books and the journals. And it's just, it's really a time capsule to go back when you realize that, you know, none of this, none of this gets used anymore. None of this really, I mean, it exists as an archive, I guess. And it's really cool that how things once were done. And, and how the records were kept. Astronomers just love climbing up and down. <laughs> That's right. They love climbing up and down ladders. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, so that's what I have. I think I'm going to stop sharing here and see if there are any other more, uh, any other comments or thoughts you guys want to share. Well, so you didn't get to look through the refractor? No, it was daytime, darn it. <laughs> Is it used? Yes, they use it for their, I mean, it's undergraduate stuff, but they use it for their astronomy programs, for their astronomy classes. So yeah, they're using that. They also have a 36 inch Cassegrain that was built in like the forties, the classic heavy duty barrel thing. I didn't I didn't get into that one, but they unlocked this one for me. So I gotta see this thing. So they let me in there, but yeah. 
I have something else worked up for you guys. I'm going to save it for a future meeting. But if you've been paying attention to Project Galileo, uh, there's a lot of cool things happening with the uh, the idea that Avi Loeb had expressed to us about the possibility of uh, extraterrestrial meteors. And uh, I want to talk about that. There's a lot of new information that's coming around, but given the hour, I'm going to hold off on that. And some future meeting, I'm going to update you on. I've been sort of following the story and it's gotten quite interesting. So we'll save that for a future time. So it seems like it's been a, a pretty interesting summer for the club. We were hit or miss for the observatory, but I mean, I got lucky on a couple of my team's nights just by chance. And uh, the attendance from the public was uh, very intense, probably as, as high as it's ever been. I think it's what we thought we would see after things returned to normal after the weird stuff of a couple of years ago. So interest remains high. Uh, stay involved, stay in touch with AAAP. This is your conduit to do astronomy. And we want to hear more about what members are doing. Um, it's not necessarily smooth trying to show these things up here at the podium, but if you would at future meetings, just you know, bring a, bring a memory drive with a, a couple of slides or some images or other things that you can share with the club. It just things, it makes things a lot more dynamic if you guys do that. So um, if there are no more comments, then I'm gonna go ahead and close the meeting, get us out of here a little bit before 10 and hope to see you next month or out at the observatory or some of the events that Bill is handling there. And to everybody on the Zooms, thank you for sticking with us. And uh, that's it from Peyton Hall. Good night. <laughs>